Good morning, and thank you for standing by. Welcome to the AV Second Quarter 2022 Earnings Conference Call. All participants will be able to listen only until the question and answer portion of this call. You may ask a question by pressing star 1 on your phone. I'd now like to introduce Ms. Liz Shea, Vice President, Head of Investor Relations. Good morning, and thanks for joining us. Also on the call with me today are Rick Gonzalez, Chairman of the Board and Chief Executive Officer, Rob Michael, Vice Chairman and President, Jeff Stewart, Executive Vice President, Chief Commercial Officer, and Tom Hudson, Senior Vice President, R&D, and Chief Scientific Officer. Joining us for the Q&A portion of the call are Laura Schumacher, Vice Chairman, External Affairs, Chief Legal Officer, and Corporate Secretary, Carrie Strom, Senior Vice President and President of Global Allergan Aesthetics, Scott Renz, Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, Neil Gallagher, Vice President, Development and Chief Medical Officer, and Rupal Thacker, Vice President, Global Regulatory Affairs. Before we get started, I'll note that some statements we make today may be considered forward-looking statements for purposes of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. Add the cautions that these forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties that may cause actual results to differ materially from those indicated in the forward-looking statements. Additional information about these risks and uncertainties is included in our SEC filings. AVI undertakes no obligation to update these forward-looking statements except as required by law. On today's conference call, non-GAAP financial measures will be used to help investors understand AVI's business performance. These non-GAAP financial measures are reconciled with comparable GAAP financial measures in our earnings release and regulatory filings from today, which can be found on our website. Following our prepared remarks, we'll take your questions. So with that, I'll now turn the call over to Rick. Thank you, Liz. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'll briefly comment on our overall performance, then Jeff, Tom, and Rob will review our second quarter business highlights, pipeline progress, and financial results in more detail. Abby delivered another strong quarter with adjusted earnings per share of $3.37, exceeding our expectations. Total net revenues of approximately $14.6 billion was up 6.1% on an operational basis in line with our expectations. This performance reflects robust double-digit operational sales growth from immunology, where SkyRizzy is exceeding our expectations with impressive market share gains in both psoriasis and PSA. SkyRizzy's recent U.S. approval in Crohn's disease will add yet another source of long-term growth. As a result of the strong performance we've seen in the first half of the year, we are raising our full-year guidance for SkyRizzy. Rinvoke is also demonstrating strong growth. RA continues to perform in line with our expectations following the label update, and we're making very good progress with all of the newly launched indications, including PSA, AS, atopic dermatitis, and ulcerative colitis, which collectively represent a significant long-term growth opportunity. <clears throat> Neuroscience is another area with outstanding performance. Valar, Botox Therapeutics, Ubrelvi, and Culipta each demonstrated double-digit sequential sales growth. Pending regulatory approvals for Valar in major depressive disorder, Culipta in chronic migraine, and 951 for the treatment of advanced Parkinson's disease represent additional near-term growth opportunities for our neuroscience portfolio. Turning now to aesthetics. Botox Cosmetics once again performed very well, with sales up more than 20% on an operational basis. Demand for toxins remains strong, with high teens growth in the U.S., despite inflation dynamics. As expected, Juvederm's performance was negatively impacted by COVID-related lockdowns in China, as well as the suspension of our operations in Russia. Additionally, in the U.S., we had a difficult prior year comparison with a promotional event that we ran last year. We also saw a modest impact in the quarter due to economic pressures. We continue to expect positive full year growth for Juvarum, driven by the lessening COVID impact in China and two new filler launches in the U.S., which will benefit growth in the second half of the year. In hematological oncology, Imbruvica continues to be unfavorably impacted by a delayed market recovery for new patients starting therapy in CLL and increasing competition. 
These ongoing dynamics will have an impact on Imbruvica's projected 2022 revenues. As a result, we will be adjusting our full-year guidance to reflect these impacts. Benclexta continues to demonstrate robust share performance in both CLL and AML, with sales up double digits on an operational basis. Benclexta also has registrational studies ongoing in addition additional attractive indications such as multiple myeloma in the T1114 patient population with phase three data forthcoming, as well as high risk MDS. Additionally, we have an exciting and diverse pipeline of promising new therapies to address critical unmet needs in both blood cancers and solid tumors, which are expected to support the next wave of AbbVie's growth in oncology. In summary, the diversity of our portfolio once again allowed us to deliver another strong performance, despite the challenges we see in the CLL market and increasing Imbruvica competition. Skyrizi and Rinvoq are performing exceptionally well and are on pace to deliver approximately $7.5 billion in combined sales this year. Neuroscience demonstrated balanced double-digit growth driven by migraine and Valar and continued robust Botox cosmetic growth offset some of the U.S. inflationary impact to our filler and body contouring portfolios. As a result, we are confirming our full year 2022 adjusted earnings per share guidance of $13.78 to $13.98, representing growth of more than 17% at the midpoint. With that, I'll turn the call over to Jeff for additional comments on our commercial highlights. Jeff? Thank you, Rick. I'm very pleased with the momentum across our therapeutic portfolio, including the continued progress we are making with new product and recent indication launches. I'll start with our immunology portfolio, which delivered total revenues of $7.2 billion, reflecting growth of 19.2% on an operational basis. Global Humira sales were approximately $5.4 billion, up 6.8% on an operational basis, with 9.6% growth in the U.S., partially offset by international performance where revenues were down 7.3% operationally due to biosimilar competition. Skyrizi is performing extremely well, well ahead of our expectations. Global revenues were more than $1.2 billion, up 33% on a sequential basis. We continue to advance our leadership position in psoriasis, where Skyrizi's total prescription share of the U.S. biological market has increased to approximately 26%, driven by an in-play share of new and switching patients that is now approaching 50%. We have also achieved in-play market share leadership in 23 key international markets, including Japan, Germany, France, Canada, and Australia. Psoriatic arthritis is also adding significantly to Skyrizi's momentum, where we are now approved in 54 countries. In the U.S. dermatology segment, where approximately 30% of patients exhibit both skin and joint involvement, Skyrizi is already achieving an in-play patient share of nearly 20%. We have also launched Skyrizi for PSA in rheumatology, where we're seeing strong utilization, which is driving accelerated share growth. Our recent launch of Skyrizi for Crohn's disease in the U.S. represents the first new biologic approval in six years for an area where there continues to be considerable unmet need. We believe Skyrizi represents a highly effective and differentiated treatment option for Crohn's patients, including the potential to provide meaningful levels of endoscopic improvement with novel and infrequent dosing. Managed care access is expected to ramp strongly for this indication in the coming months. Turning now to Rinvoq, where we're seeing good momentum across each of the approved indications. Global sales of $592 million were up more than 27% on a sequential basis. Prescriptions in RA remain strong, with a total market share of 5.8% in the U.S. and approximately 6% across key international markets. Rinvoq is now achieving an in-play RA share of approximately 13% in the U.S. In PSA, Rinvoq continues to see nice uptake, especially in the room segment, with commercial access now equal to RA. We also recently received FDA approval for ankylosing spondylitis, 
and European approval for non-radiographic axial spa, further expanding RINVOC's potential across rheumatology. In atopic dermatitis, new patient starts are tracking in line with our expectations, with RINVOC's in-play patient share in the mid-teens. Strong commercial access in AD, which is also now equal to RA and PSA, is expected to considerably increase paid prescription volume in this highly underpenetrated market over the remainder of the year. Lastly, our recent launch of RINVOC for ulcerative colitis in the U.S. is progressing well, and we recently just received European approval for the same indication. Commercial access in the U.S. is ramping strongly, and we are seeing encouraging new patient starts. Physician feedback regarding RINVOC's approved profile in UC has been favorable, especially given the very high rates of remission and endoscopic improvement demonstrated across our UC development program. The addressable patient population for RINVOC in UC is substantial, with nearly 50% of patients currently on or having used TNF therapy. Turning now to hematologic oncology, where total revenues were $1.65 billion, down 7.9% on an operational basis. Imbruvica global revenues were approximately $1.1 billion, down 17.1%, and below our expectations. The CLL market continues to remain challenging in the U.S., with new patient starts down double digits relative to pre-pandemic levels. Now, as you may recall, our initial 2022 Imbruvica sales guidance contemplated a partial market recovery, which unfortunately we have not yet observed. In fact, the latest data reflects new patient starts in the U.S. were actually down high single digits versus last year. So based on recent trends, we no longer believe it's prudent to anticipate a meaningful market recovery in CLL over the second half of this year. Therefore, we will be removing this assumption from our 2022 guidance. In addition, increasing competition from newer therapies, including other BTK inhibitors, as well as our own Venclexta, also continue to lower Imbruvica's share of new patient starts, especially in frontline CLL. Despite this increasing competitive pressure, Imbruvica continues to be the total market share leaders across all lines of therapy in CLL. Venclexta global sales were $505 million, up 21.2% on an operational basis. In CLL, we continue to see share gains in the U.S. and across all major international markets. We're also seeing continued strong performance in AML. Venclexta is now approved in 80 countries and in many markets is already considered the new standard of care for frontline AML patients who are ineligible for intensive chemotherapy. As a result, we are seeing ramping market share throughout the countries where we have launched. In neuroscience, Revenues were more than $1.6 billion, up 15.2% on an operational basis. Raylar once again delivered strong growth. Sales of $492 million were up 13.9% on an operational basis, reflecting continued share gains in the U.S. atypical antipsychotic market. Our launch preparations remain well underway in anticipation of our MDD approval in the fourth quarter. This is a potentially large indication that would represent incremental upside to our current projections for Vralar. Within migraine, Ubrelvi remains the market-leading oral CGRP treatment for acute migraine, with revenue of $185 million, up 34% on a sequential basis. Qlifta continues to increase its leading new-to-brand share in the U.S. preventative CGRP class when we consider both paid and bridge volume. We continue to make good progress with expanded commercial access, which will support strong q to sales growth over the remainder of this year. We are also pursuing the commercial approval for q as a preventative treatment in patients with chronic migraine in the U.S., as well as a new therapy for Europe, potentially further strengthening our competitive product profile and long-term growth opportunity. Botox Therapeutic is also performing well in chronic migraine, as well as its other indications with total sales of $678 million, up 14.5% on an operational basis. So overall, I'm pleased with the commercial execution across the therapeutic business. Our broad portfolio of differentiated therapies and new launches is demonstrating strong revenue growth. 
And with that, I'll turn the call over to Tom for additional comments on our R&D programs. Tom? Thank you, Jeff. I'll start with immunology, where we had several notable pipeline updates in our inflammatory bowel disease programs for both Skyrizi and Rinvoke. We recently received FDA approval for Skyrizi in Crohn's disease, and we're very pleased with the label, which reflects the strong benefit-risk profile that Skyrizi demonstrated as an induction and maintenance treatment for this condition. Based on its profile, we believe Skyrizi will be a highly effective and differentiated treatment option for patients with Crohn's disease. Our regulatory application for Skyrizi in Crohn's disease remains under review in Europe with an approval decision expected near the end of this year. Also, in the area of inflammatory bowel disease, we recently received European approval for Rinvoke in ulcerative colitis, and we're excited to bring this new, highly efficacious oral option to patients suffering from this often debilitating disease. In the quarter, we also completed a registrational program for Rinvoke in Crohn's disease, reporting positive top-line results from our Phase three maintenance study. We recently submitted our regulatory applications for Rinvoke in this indication and expect approval decisions next year. Once approved for Crohn's disease, Rinvoke will have completed development programs for all the major room and gastro indications covered by Humira plus atopic dermatitis. The strength of the data generated in our clinical programs should position Rinvoke as a highly differentiated treatment across this broad indication set and enable Rinvoke to deliver significant value to AbV over the long term. And just this morning, we announced that we received European approval for Rinvoke in non-radiographic axial spa, which rounds out Rinvoke's label in rheumatology. Moving now to our oncology portfolio, where we continue to make excellent progress across all stages of our pipeline. At the recent EHA meeting, we presented results from the large B-cell lymphoma expansion cohort in the phase two study evaluating epcoritimab in patients who have received at least two prior lines of the therapy. In this study, epcoritimab was well tolerated and drove very deep and durable responses in challenging to treat highly refractory patients with large B-cell lymphoma. We recently discussed these results with regulatory agencies and based on the strength of the data, we intend to submit regulatory applications later this year for accelerated approval of epcoritimab in patients with relapsed refractory large B-cell lymphoma. We expect approval decisions in 2023. We continue to make good progress with the indication expansion programs for Venclexta and remain on track to see results from the Phase three CANOVA trial in relapsed refractory multiple myeloma patients with a T1114 mutation in the second half of this year. As a reminder, we've seen very promising results in this population in prior clinical studies with Venclexta showing high overall response rates and meaningful trends towards prolonged progression-free survival. The level of efficacy we've seen suggests that T1114 patients may be particularly respons responsive to Venclexta, and this agent has the potential to become an important biomarker-driven treatment option in the multiple myeloma market. In neuroscience, following successful completion of our phase three chronic migraine prevention study, we submitted our regulatory application to the FDA for Culipta in chronic migraine. Chronic migraine is defined as 15 or more headache days per month with at least eight of those days associated with migraines. This is a debilitating disease that affects nearly 10% of people suffering from migraines, significantly impacting their quality of life. If approved, this would be another differentiating feature for Culipta, as it would be the only oral CGRP approved for prevention 
in patients with chronic migraine. We also submitted data from our phase three prevention studies in both chronic and episodic migraine to support regulatory applications in markets outside the U.S. We expect approval decisions in the U.S. and in Europe in 2023. In the quarter, we submitted our regulatory application in the U.S. for ABBV 951, our novel subcutaneous levodopa carbidopa delivery system for treatment of advanced Parkinson's disease. This innovative delivery system has the potential to become a transformative treatment option for patients with, Parkin with advanced Parkinson's disease by providing duopa-like efficacy with less invasive non-surgical administration. We also expect to submit our regulatory application in Europe later this year with approval decisions anticipated in both the US and Europe in 2023. Now I'd like to provide a few updates on some earlier stage programs where we have new data and are advancing programs in development. In immunology, we recently obtained encouraging data in a phase two study evaluating RINVOC in systemic lupus, an autoimmune multisystem disease. In our study, RINVOC demonstrated greater response rates as well as a reduction in flares compared with placebo. We'll see longer term data in the coming months, which will allow us to make a decision on moving RINVOC into phase three for lupus. In oncology, where we have a pipeline of promising early stage programs aimed at solid tumors, we are beginning to see very exciting data from several programs. Our anti-GARP antibody, ABBV151, is designed to block the immunosuppressive activity of regulatory T cells, which leads to increased T cell effective function in the tumor microenvironment. This reactivates the immune system against tumors, enhancing the anti-tumor immune response triggered by a PD-1 inhibitor. In our phase one program, we're combining 151 with a PD-1 checkpoint inhibitor in cancer patients who are refractory to or relapsed after a PD-1, as well as evaluating this combination in PD-1 non-responsive tumors. Based on the preliminary efficacy we've seen in the dose expansion cohorts, for multiple solid tumors, including a deepening of responses over time and prolonged dur durability, we recently declared proof of concept for 151. We plan to advance to phase two in several solid tumors, starting with urothelial cancer. We're also expecting additional data readouts later this year in other solid tumor indications, including colorectal cancer which may enable further expansion studies in this hard to treat cancer type. We will also begin new studies to explore a broader set of solid tumors where GARP is implicated as a critical immunosuppressive pathway based on tissue, uh, tumor tissue analyses. We're also making excellent progress with our next generation CMET ADC, AB, ABBV 400, where the emerging clinical data is very promising in several solid tumors. This asset is similar to Teliso V, a CMET ADC that uses a microtubulin inhibitor payload. Teliso V received breakthrough therapy designation for the treatment of patients with a subtype of lung cancer with high levels of CMET overexpression. The toxin warhead for 400 uses a more potent topoisomerase inhibitor payload, which is similar to irinotecan, a chemotherapy that is used in the treatment of colorectal cancer. By targeting CMET positive tumors with ADCs bearing different warheads, we believe we can broaden the range of solid tumors where CMET therapies can be used. In our phase one program, we are seeing good responses in patients with advanced colorectal cancer and remain encouraged by these early efficacy signals. So in summary, we've seen tremendous progress across all stages of our pipeline in the first half of the year, and we remain on track for further advancements in the remainder of 2022. So with that, I'll turn the call over to Rob for additional comments 
on our second quarter performance and financial outlook. Rob? Thank you, Tom. Avi's second quarter results demonstrate the strength of our diversified portfolio. Momentum from new products and recently launched indications allows us to maintain our earnings outlook despite market dynamics for Imbruvica, higher inflation, and the stronger U.S. dollar. We reported adjusted earnings per share of $3.37, reflecting growth of 11.2% compared to prior year and $0.11 cents above our guidance midpoint. These results include a $0.14 cent unfavorable impact from acquired IPRD expense. Total net revenues were $14.6 billion, up 6.1% on an operational basis, excluding a 1.6% unfavorable impact from foreign exchange. The adjusted operating margin ratio was 51% of sales, an improvement of 220 basis points versus the prior year. This includes adjusted gross margin of 84.7% of sales, adjusted R&D investment of 11% of sales, acquired IPRD expense of 1.8% of sales, and adjusted SG&A expense of 20.8% of sales. Net interest expense was $532 million, and the adjusted tax rate was 13.4%. Turning to our financial outlook, we are confirming our full-year adjusted earnings per share guidance between $13.78 and $13.98. This earnings per share guidance does not include an estimate for acquired IPRD expense that may be incurred beyond the second quarter. We now expect net revenues of approximately $58.9 billion, reflecting growth of 6.5% on an operational basis. At current rates, we expect foreign exchange to have a 1.7% unfavorable impact on full-year sales growth. Included in this guidance are the following updated assumptions. We now expect SkyRizzy global sales of approximately $4.8 billion, an increase of $400 million due to strong market share performance. For Imbruvica, we now expect global revenue of approximately $4.7 billion, given the lack of recovery in the CLL market and increasing competition. Moving to the P&L, we now expect adjusted gross margin of 84.7% of sales and continue to forecast an adjusted operating margin ratio of 51.8% of sales. Turning to the third quarter, we anticipate net revenues of approximately $14.8 billion. At current rates, we expect foreign exchange to have a 2.1% unfavorable impact on sales growth. We expect adjusted earnings per share between $3.55 and $3.59. This guidance does not include acquired IPRD expense that may be incurred in the quarter. In closing, we delivered strong performance again this quarter, including meaningful contributions from new products and recently launched indications. Given the momentum of our business, as well as our pipeline advancements, we are well positioned for the long term. With that, I'll turn the call back over to Liz. Thanks, Rob. We will now open the call for questions. In the interest of hearing from as many analysts as possible over the remainder of the call, we ask that you please limit your questions to one or two. Operator, we'll take the first question. Thank you. Our first question is Andrew Baum, City. Your line's open. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, first question is on um, the guidance range you've given for uh, anticipated trajectory of Humira in the U.S. Presumably you're finishing contracting both with Medicare and commercial. Uh, could you provide any guidance further on 23 and even 24, given I'm sure there are some two-year contracts? Um, and then second, uh, a pipeline question in, in relation to your anti-GARP monoclonal, which you've taken a, you know, a long time to, to optimize and move forward. Um, I'm just curious whether you're using any molecular markers in order to minimize risk given the failures of other TGF beta targeted agents, particularly in colorectal, are you using CMS4 or a subgroup of the total population, or are you putting it in all comers? There's a suggestion it works in all comers, or is this again informed by biomarkers? Thank you. Okay, Andrew, this is uh, Rick. Thank you for the questions. I'll, I'll cover the first one, then Tom uh, can cover the second one. 
So we are in the process now, uh, as we've indicated before, of <coughs> negotiating with the managed care organizations and the PBMs to establish our contract position for Humira uh, in 2023. This is the normal time that you would go through that. Uh, it is progressing as we would expect. Uh, I would say we're uh, midway through that process right now. Uh, I would expect it to uh, conclude uh, near the end of the third quarter, early the fourth quarter. At that point, that's an important part of refining our model for 2023 in particular. And what that will tell us is that, you know, the positions that we have formulary status for 2023 in uh, for Humira, and that will help us define clearly the volume aspect of it. Uh, and so, you know, that's going well, and that's, that's going to be an important part of us being able to refine that model. And so as we get further along in that process, that will give us the ability to be able to potentially uh, refine the model that we have. Now, the one thing that's important to remember in all of this is price is the other key aspect here. And there, we won't know real pricing until the actual event starts to occur. So we will make assumptions around what that price looks like. And uh, I think those will be informed assumptions, but they are just that, they're assumptions. And so that, that's the one piece that will still be somewhat of an unknown until we see the, uh, the landscape start to play out in 2023, and uh, particularly in, the, in midway through 2023 when more biosimilars enter the market. So as we get more information and we can provide more clarity, we'll certainly try to do that. Uh, but I think that's where we are right now. Tom? Hey, thank you. Andrew, I'll, I'll try to break down the question in different parts uh, because you're right. There are many uh, TGF beta assets. This one's unique, GARP. Uh, most of the TGF beta assets work either uh, antibodies against uh, receptors to the active form of TGF beta or TGF beta itself uh, that's uh, in, uh, in, in circulation or in cells. But uh, GARP blocks uh, the inactive form of TGF beta before it's released from TGF beta. And we believe that actually is a differentiating mechanism, also allows that specificity to what's happening in TGF beta uh, in the tumor as opposed to other systems in the body. Uh, at the beginning of this, we thought, we had already had people that published that there are very, uh, very good TG, uh, TGF beta signatures that exist. And I can tell you that GARP signature follows tracks with TGF beta signatures. And that's often seen in all solid tumors or susceptible tumors that express these pathways. It's a very common immunosuppressive mechanism. That's why people and us are interested in it. Uh, we learned initially uh, we, from data, we, we kind of suspected that people who actually had a nice hot tumors but were not responding to, uh, to PD-1s uh, often had, at least from one checkpoint response, by, by doing this combination. We did not see uh, monotherapy activity, but in combination we did. And that's why our first uh, data, data sets and expansions, like I've just discussed in urothelial cancer, these projects started earlier. We're seeing data that's su suggesting that this is correct, that you need to flex both the pathway of TGF beta and, and PD-1 to get a response. And those, again, in multiple tumor types, we're seeing these responses, and we're moving, moving forward. At the same time, because to bring it to colon, uh, we could also see these same signatures of TGF beta and GARP in, uh, in cold tumors, but we weren't sure that since they're not IO responsive, whether we'd get a response, uh, we would get a clinical response. But we did start some, some investigations, and, and yes, we did see some responses in cold tumors. Um, they happen over time, uh, not in multi-therapy. Sometimes they appear, people, the tumors are stable for three months, maybe six months. And then you see these responses up here. They're very durable, one year, two year, uh, very unusual. These are patients with advanced disease that have very poor prognosis in phase one studies. So we saw some, some uh, I would say, I, we sometimes say uh, in academia, call them exceptional responders. Um, and so we decided to expand. So those data sets are, are, are newer, are, are happening right now. I, I probably will have the data at the end of this year. But yes, we've seen, uh, the sign we've seen uh, responses to this combination. Uh, and to answer your question, so the signatures we're looking at are not the CMS or kind of histology-based signatures on the tumor. It's more signatures of the inflammatory response that we can measure in the tumor, and it has to do with both, uh, both uh, 
inflammatory uh, T cells, which are there for the killing, but also the inhibitory TGF beta uh, signatures. And, and of course, we're going to continue to investigate this. I don't have all the answers for you today, but it certainly has been exciting to see how this evolved, program has evolved. Thanks, Andrew. Operator, Thank we'll take the next question, please. Thank you. Our next question is Terrence Flynn with Morgan Stanley. Hi, thanks for taking the questions. Um, maybe two for me. Uh, just wanted to make sure that you are maintaining your 2022 aesthetics guidance uh, of 5.9 billion. Um, Rob, I didn't hear you call it out, so I'm assuming that was a reiteration, um, just given what you're seeing um, with Juvederm in the U.S. And then the second question I had relates more of a, I guess, strategic one, Rick. You know, I know you're still going through the conversations with 2023 for Humira, but as you think about you know, providing an update to guidance, um, you know, whether that happens with the three key results or with the four key results, do you think you'll be able to provide some outlook on 2024? Because I think something investors are discussing now is just if the possibility of, you know, the, the impact is more in 24, how we should think about, you know, revenue margins in 24 versus 23. So just wondering strategically how you're thinking about that at this point, not asking for guidance, more just thought process. Thank you. Okay. So, Terrence, I'll, I'll take both of those questions, and then Rob can certainly jump in here if he has something he wants to add. Uh, we are maintaining the aesthetics guidance, uh, as, uh, as we've indicated. Certainly, we have seen, you know, good, strong performance on the toxin side of the business, and we would expect it to continue. As we look at the filler side of the business, as, as you've noted, uh, we, it was lighter this quarter than we've seen historically. And I'd say that was driven by a couple of issues. It was certainly driven by the China-Russia issue outside the U.S. In the U.S., we did have a very successful promotional uh, program that we ran last year, so it was a tough comparison versus last year. But i also say we have seen some glimpses of uh, what could be inflationary pressure uh, on that business. Um, or it could be pent-up demand for vacations. And Carrie can certainly go through it in more detail if there's a follow-up question. Um, but I think as we look at the business overall, we're comfortable maintaining the guidance now. We believe that Botox will continue to perform very well, and obviously we're doing more things to be able to drive the toxin side of the business. It's at a price point where it should be less sensitive to inflationary pressures, you know, the price point for toxins is about $500, I think, right, Gary? And uh, where fillers are almost twice that or maybe even a little more than twice that. So clearly from a, from a disposable income standpoint, fillers are more challenging for people than, than toxins are. And so that's the rationale behind it. And certainly as we look at the overall performance of, of the Abbey business, we have plenty of opportunity. Uh, with the diversity of our portfolio to cover any potential shortfall if we ended up having any shortfall. So that's why we're comfortable maintaining the guidance. And I think we need to see more time play out here uh, to see exactly where we are from a U.S. inflationary impact. On the second question, as it relates to uh, an update on uh, 23 and potentially something on 24, uh, I, I think the way you've described it is accurate. When we have more information, uh, we'll try to provide that. Uh, and when we've gotten to a point that cer certainly by the fourth quarter call, we're going to provide you guidance uh, on what we think will happen in 2023. But if we can provide something on the third quarter call, I, I wouldn't be looking for guidance. I think that's, a, that's not a good expectation. But certainly uh, potentially a little more clarification on what our contracting status looks like at that point and how that will uh, translate into what we think. And if we can refine the model uh, to a greater degree, we would certainly provide that. As it relates to 2024, uh, you know, certainly I'm not going to, uh, we're not in a position where we're going to talk about 2024 right now. And I think that would be a little bit unlikely because not all these contracts will be uh, two year contracts. And so you really won't know what your volume position is uh, at that point. And as I said, you won't know what the pricing is going to be, particularly midway through the year. And so I think those will be important, uh, important uh, things to be able to dial in uh, to where the forecast is going. I'd say overall we feel good about the contracting uh, position that we're in. Um, 
And then I'd say the other thing is, and I know investors really want to try to model this between 23 and 24. I understand why you want to do that. Certainly, we obviously would like to do that to the greatest degree possible. But when you step back and you actually look at the performance of AbbVie and how you will value AbbVie and what AbbVie means going forward, it has relatively little to do with Humira uh, and that shape of that curve between 23 and 24. And certainly by the end of 24, we should reach a point where we've achieved some level of stability on the tail of Humira. What Abby's all about is these other products like Skyrizi and Rinvoke and uh, Valar and Ubrelvi, uh, the aesthetics business, Culepta. Those are going to be the things that drive it. So if you want to focus on something, uh, and it's what we focus on internally, is that underlying growth engine that will emerge on the other side of whatever erosion Humera ends up suffering before it hits some level of stability in a tail is those assets and then what comes out of the pipeline. Those are the key things that are going to create that growth between 25 and 30. And that's the part that we, I would say, we're obviously managing Humera to the greatest extent we can, but that's the part that we as a team are focusing on. And I think that's the most important part, because that is the ABDI going forward. Thanks, Taryn. Operator, let's take the next question, please. Thank you. Our next question is Mohip Bonzel with Wells Fargo. Great. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, uh, maybe dwelling a little bit more on the on the on the Himara question for Rick and Jeff. Uh, so, uh, so you said that pricing from the competition would be key and known for next year. So, as you get into contracts this year for the next year, how rigid or flexible these contracts are from the pricing point of view? When PBMs realize that the buyer similar is giving an X or Y pricing, or would that be a more of a 2024 issue rather than 2023? Thank you. Well, let me take a shot at that. And, uh, certainly, Jeff is uh, closer to it. So, Jeff, if, uh, if you want to add anything in, feel free to jump in and add. Typically, when you contract for an asset like Humera, you're contracting for a formulary position. And, um, and you know, there aren't volume requirements uh, or other kinds of requirements. I think it's also... Uh, it would be prudent to assume that biosimilars will be on these contracts, uh, and uh, whether it's one or more than one that will coexist with Humera. So, so price plays an important role in that because they will coexist. And so, um, so I'd say, and, and as as that becomes fluid, you would have to make decisions around how you tried to deal with that. Uh, to maintain the kinds of volumes that you want to maintain. And we've said all along the strategy that we'll have in the U.S. is similar to the strategy that we had internationally, and that is maintain as much volume as we can at the highest level of profit that we can maintain it at. And that, that is the logic that we will, we will employ. But that doesn't mean we won't have to be somewhat responsive to prices in the marketplace on Humira. Uh, Jeff, anything you'd add? No, I think that's uh, that's uh, Rick. That's a very uh, uh, very reasonable way to look at it in terms of how these negotiations are going and how we see 23 playing out. I mean, the the real big ones in terms of how we look at it is the two big the two big scenarios are you are likely coexisting with one or more biosimilars, or if the negotiations don't go the way that we anticipate, that we're excluded in favor of biosimilars. And that's basically where price and volume, uh, you know, in terms of refining our model uh, for 23, that's the work that we're doing over the summer and then into the fall. Right. Helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mohit. Uh, operator, next question, please. Thank you. Next question is Gary Nachman with BMO Capital Markets. Hi, thanks. Good morning. Um, so Skyrizi was very strong in the second quarter, and you raised guidance nicely. How much of a benefit are you getting from the psoriatic arthritis indication thus far? And what are you expecting Crohn's to contribute this year? Um, how much are those playing into the raised guidance? And are you revisiting uh, the long-term 
guidance on SCARISI at this point, given the strong performance? And then just on, on the HEMONC franchise, um, are you keeping the infrastructure intact, preparing for new products to contribute? And maybe you could talk about the near-term opportunities you see for products like epcaritimab and the Vitaclax, how much those could contribute um, and potentially offset some of the pressure you've been seeing from Imbruvica. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. It's Jeff. Uh, thanks for the question. So uh, your, your instinct and observation is right. The, 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 big, the big dynamic change for Skyrizi here, largely what you're seeing is from the psoriatic arthritis indication. And obviously saw very, very large sequential moves. And let me give you some sense of, of what we're looking at. So we're seeing that we're putting more and more uh, basically uh, headroom into the overall share position first in, in psoriatic disease. So that's psoriasis plus PSA. So we're at 26% in terms of total TRX share and moving very, very nicely up. So that's being driven by this PSA acceleration. So first remember that the PSA indication, we were the really the last large product that didn't have that indication. So first what happens is it starts to interact very positively in the dermatology segment. So as I mentioned, about 30% of patients both have skin and joint involvement. And so we actually had a lower, despite the fact that we had the leading psoriasis share, we had a lower psoriasis share because we weren't covered with the joints with that indication. So you see an immediate, very rapid acceleration of our overall derm business that I highlighted. Secondly, strategically important to the uh, performance is that we're able to launch the PSA indication for Skyrizi in rheumatology. So it starts to work together with the Rinvoke PSA indication, and the room segment is three times as large as the derm segment. So it's a very, very good dynamic uh, in terms of our momentum in two large segments even before we get to Crohn's. Now, I would say that, as we've talked about before, I mean, Skyrizi is a very special product, you know, very unique dosing, very stable, incredible efficacy. Uh, and so we're, we, we are encouraged on the early results of Crohn's. It's too early to start to see numbers or et cetera. Uh, but all of that is playing into, uh, you know, the, the raise that Rob talked about. And, Gary, this is Rob, just on, on the guidance. So if you recall on, uh, earlier in the year we got asked a question, I said PSA for SkyRizzi was going to contribute about $200 million this year. It's probably closer to $400 million now with the guidance range, given the very nice uptake we've seen in PSA. But part of that guidance raise is also the strong share performance in psoriasis. So it, it includes both. Uh, in terms of Crohn's, that hasn't changed. We've said approximately $100 million this year as we ramp uh, access for, for Crohn's. But obviously the long-term potential for it is tremendous, and we're very excited about that. And maybe I can also then chime in on the second question. Uh, certainly that is a um, – it's a, the, the new assets are a very important part of our growth story for, for Hemonc. Certainly, as I mentioned, we're still continuing to ramp around the world with CLL. We have, you know, more and more impressive data, particularly in the unfit frontline population. We have five years of data in the fit population for frontline for Venclexta. Uh, we're encouraged with the myeloma data, which is very unique in terms of a biomarker-driven uh, approach for the 1114. Uh, Nivitaclax would be really one of the first new entrants for myelofibrosis, where there's really only been uh, rocks in terms of that, that market. Uh, Epcaritimab, increasingly uh, encouraging data in terms of uh, the simple sub-Q, very rapid ways to get uh, this medication in later lines and then building into front lines. So we are very, very encouraged while we see some pressure on Imbruvica, the new indications and in base for Venclexta helps to offset that, and then we start to build with those near-term uh, heme assets and uh, super uh, encouraged in terms of what we're seeing in terms of the probability that we can get there. Thanks, Gary. Operator, next Thank question, you. please. Thank you. Our next question is from Chris Schott, J.P. Morgan. Uh, great. Thanks so much for the questions. Um, first one, I just wanted to come back to dynamics on the U.S. dermal filler market. I guess specifically, can you just quantify how much of the weakness we saw this or the, the decline year over year was due to the promotion uh, events last year versus the impact from the economic pressures that you're seeing 
And I guess in that same context, are you seeing any signs of weakness in the European business? I'm just, I think we're always trying to get our hands around what type of magnitude of impact you're talking about here in terms of either if it's inflation or economic sensitivity to that business. Uh, my second question was just thinking about Rinvoke and SkyRizzy formulary and pricing dynamics going forward as biosimilar Humira enters the market. I guess are you expecting or are you hearing as, uh, through discussions any major shifts in the way payers are thinking about those products as we think about pricing coming down and you know, obviously the largest uh, kind of product in, in the space there? Thanks so much. Uh, hi, this is Carrie. I'll take your first question around Juvederm. And as Rick said, there was a one-time promotional event that we ran in the U.S. for Juvederm in Q2 of last year. And it was highly successful, and it you know, increased sales in the sales space, which created this challenging prior year comparison. Um, so that was the, the, the key driver. But as, as you noted, there was also this impact, uh, economic impact that is suggestive of some early changes in consumer behavior. And that really isn't surprising in light of the inflationary pressures that we're seeing on discretionary income. And as Rick said, the uh, filler market is likely more sensitive to that than toxins for a few reasons. Uh, we mentioned the price point. So a uh, price point of closer to $1,000 versus $500 for toxin. Also, the nature of the filler business is different than toxin from a patient dynamic and treatment dynamic in that uh, there are more in there's a longer interval between treatments for fillers versus toxins, which is sort of like a more regular treatment paradigm a few times a year. Also, the patient bases are different. When you think about the toxin patient base and Botox Cosmetics, the majority of the patient base is continuing patients versus more of a reliance on new patient acquisition. Um, and so, you know, those are some of the factors we're thinking about when we think about the deceleration of the filler market in Q2. Um, but while, you know, the market has slowed and despite the performance in Q2, we do continue to expect a positive second half growth uh, for U.S. Juvederm, really weighted more in the fourth quarter as we're going to launch two new fillers in the fourth quarter. And those two new fillers will get us into incremental categories for HA fillers, including jawline and skin quality, which will help to drive some incremental demand at the end of the year. And in terms of your question around economic impact outside of the U.S., uh, we are watching that very closely, and we really have not seen that yet outside of the U.S. In terms of your second question, again, it's Jeff. Thanks for that. Um, you know, we're, we, we don't see uh, some significant pressures on SkyRizzy and Rinvog. Now, we always have uh, uh, discussions with the payers. We look at our contracting strategy, but I think we fall back on our clinical uh, evidence that we have on these two major assets. I mean, we have we have four head-to-head -head trials against uh, other major competitors with uh, with SkyRizzy, where we have you know just really gross superiority versus whether it's an IL-17, whether it's you know uh, Humera, which one day will be biosimilar, uh, Stellara, et cetera. So just the pure performance there and the momentum, it's clearly a distinguished asset. You know, we're going to be first in terms of Chrome's to start to establish that new area and build the and build the uh, build the market there. And I think on Rinvoke to some degree, there's only one other Jack inhibitor that is not going to have the scope of indications, and it's Zelljance. And Zelljance has been, you know, significantly uh, wounded based on the oral surveillance data. So in terms of our ability to, you know, build and protect and 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 grow uh, Skyrizi and Rinvoke. Uh, into the next stage of development, we're, we're quite confident that we have the assets to be able to do that. Thanks, Chris. Operator, next question, please. And thank you. Our next question is from Steve Scala. Colin, your line's open. Well, thank you very much. Two questions. First, Rick, in the past, you have laid out four factors that will dictate Humira's trajectory in 2023. The first two were Humira access and biosimilar price, and it's clear it's too early uh, for any news on either of those points. But the second two were competitiveness of biosimilars, which um, you said in part was interchangeability, and also the biosimilar av ability to supply the market. So those two factors, three and four, are things that won't fluctuate, and presumably you have some visibility on that now. So I'm just wondering if there's anything unusual occurring there and 
in discussions, how important is interchangeability with payers? The second question is, and I apologize if I missed it, but are there any updates on the TNF steroid conjugate um, and is phase two RA data still expected this year? Thank you. All right, uh, thanks, Steve. This is Rick. I'll cover the first one, um, and uh, Rupo can cover the second one. Um, so you are correct. That is what I described a meeting or two ago as the, the four variables. I would say when you think about interchangeability, I think you have to think about it in the backdrop of not just interchangeability, but also what is the profile that is the closest to Humira today. And we can look at all the biosimilars and have a, you know, we have pretty good visibility as to what that profile looks like. And what I would say is to get a profile that is interchangeable and is consistent with, uh, with the current Humira that's predominantly in the marketplace today, that's probably going to occur in the summer of 2023. There should be one or two biosimilars that have a profile that looks like that. And that would make it somewhat easier uh, for an organization to make a, a switch. Uh, so I think that will play an important variable. Nothing has changed in the last few months uh, in what that profile looks like. And then obviously supply is, uh, is an important aspect that certainly anyone that we're looking at making a significant change in their position with Humira is going to want to make sure that they're going with a company that has the ability to be able to produce at volume, at significant volumes, uh, Humira, and they can do it you know, sustainably. Um, so, you know, I, so there are certain players that I would say uh, clearly have that ability to be able to do it, similar to us. Certainly no one does it at the scale of us uh, or anywhere close to the scale of us. But there are also a lot of small players that I think supply is going to be an important aspect and going to somewhat limit the ability to be able to have broad market impact. And uh, so those are going to be important dynamics as we negotiate with the various managed care organizations. I can, I can tell you that we're talking through those kinds of things with them. Rupal? Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, so 154 is our anti-TNF conjugated steroid, as you mentioned, and it's uh, enabled uh, to target uh, delivery steroid directly to the inflammatory cells. So we do have that phase two running several hundred patients, and we still anticipate getting a read uh, later this year, and then further data to follow next year. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Operator, next question, please. Thank you. Our next question is Chris Raymond, Piper Sadler. Your line's open. Uh, thanks, guys. Um, yeah, two questions, maybe one that's um, more broad, policy and then another one that's maybe a little bit more detailed. So maybe first for Rick, uh, I know you guys keep pretty close tabs on healthcare policy. Um, just on the, the most recent Senate Democrat um, drug pricing language in the reconciliation recon bill, you know, the provisions on the face of it seem pretty manageable in terms of direct impact um, from pricing controls, but you know, there's been some concern around this being just the start of something larger in terms of price controls. You know, any thoughts from you guys on this um, would be appreciated. And then maybe a more detailed question on ABVV 951. You know, I know you guys haven't provided specific guidance on this or on Duodopa, but, you know, there seems to be a lot of recognition um, of 951 among movement disorder KOLs um, as a real improvement, you know, in terms of, you know, overcoming, you know, reticence around Duodopa. Just how, how should we be thinking about 951 vis-a-vis -vis Duodopa, um, you know, if approved? Thanks. Okay. Uh, so I'll take the first, first question. I mean, I think if you look at the, uh, the drug pricing proposal that's out there, uh, it's certainly an important issue for us, and I think uh, it's an important issue for patients. Uh, I think if I look at that bill, and I'm assuming that if there were something that were to pass, it would be somewhat consistent with what was in Build Back Better or the Senate Finance text. And, and so far it looks like that, but it's obviously evolving a bit here as we go along. And if I look at it in total, what I'd say is there's a couple of positive things in there. 
uh, certainly most notably the $2,000 uh, cap on out-of-pocket costs for patients and the ability to be able to smooth. I think that's, a, that's an important step in increasing affordability, especially for patients in Medicare uh, Part D. And so that's something we've been supportive of. We've been vocal that we think that's an important step forward. But I'd say on balance, this is a bill that has far more negatives than it has positives in it. And I think, frankly, although it may not be short term, uh, that challenging from a financial standpoint, I think the long term implications of this bill are pretty significant. And they really uh, hinge around this so called negotiation clause. Uh, that's in there and how that's being implemented, particularly for small molecules. And uh, if you're familiar with it, essentially what it says is that CMS, or we're assuming it will be CMS, has the ability at a certain point in time to be able to negotiate uh, a price on a set of drugs. And by the time you get there, it will be a big set of drugs uh, that they'll have the ability to be able to negotiate on. And the, the key issue is this, you know, essentially they have full latitude to basically decide whatever price they want the drug to be. And I wouldn't necessarily call it a negotiation because the only alternative that the manufacturer has is to accept a 95% penalty on their revenues or, in essence, take a 95% discount. So it's not, it's not negotiation. We should just call it what it is. It's, it's price control is what they're basically putting in place if the language stays the same. And ultimately, I think the real challenge is how we invest in this industry, as an industry in innovation. If you take small molecules as an example, I'll walk you through an example that illustrates the point I'm gonna, I'm gonna raise here. If you take a small molecule, it says at year nine after the first approval, CMS has the right to be able to negotiate the price on that drug. So if you take an oncology drug as an example, how do we develop oncology drugs in this industry? And what do the regulatory authorities typically require us to do to be able to develop an oncology drug? Well, they typically require you to do, and what we typically do, is we go into patients who have failed on all the existing therapies, fourth-line patients, fifth-line patients, and we take whatever drug we have and we determine do we have a positive benefit risk in that patient population. If we find that we do, then we seek approval for that drug in that patient population so that those patients will get the benefit of that drug. And then we start to work our way up towards front line. Those refractory patients are typically very small populations of patients, right? And you could never get a return on a drug just on that patient population. And then you work your way up to front line or second line or wherever you end up. That, tip, that process typically takes seven to nine years because of the length of the trials. So essentially with this, by the time you got to the larger populations, you'd be within a year or two of when CMS could change the price. So one, it's impossible to figure out what the return is gonna be, so how do you invest? Two, it really puts negative pressure on you not to continue to develop new indications. But the most detrimental part of it is to patients who need these drugs or small indications or in later stage. Because you're faced with the dilemma, and this is a horrible dilemma, right, as a company and for patients. You're faced with the dilemma of do I choose not to seek approval in those late stage patients so I don't start the clock and wait until I'm closer to front line before I start the clock. That is not the right policy. And um, you know, I would say, you know, on balance, this, this bill will have a couple of things that are good for patients and I'm fully supportive of. But unless Congress wants to harm patients and harm innovation in this industry, they need to change that part of it. It doesn't make sense. It's short-sighted. Now, they can change it in a couple of different ways. They can determine, okay, what is a floor price or a maximum discount by year? And then you can calculate the return on investment that you're going to have on the drug. Or... They can at least make it consistent with biologics that are out at 13 years. Otherwise, the investment in small molecule oncology drugs or neuroscience drugs, which Medicare patient populations are highly dependent upon new innovative drugs in those areas because they're elderly patients, are going to suffer. And the CBO report that was published back in April of last year clearly pointed that out. So this isn't something I'm just saying or 
or industries just saying. And in fact, if anything, I'd say they, they probably undercall the magnitude of the impact. So this is an important issue. We all know that affordability and access for Medicare patients is important, but you don't need to destroy the innovation model in the process in order to provide that. And so I, I'm a hopeful that we'll see some movement here and some rationality will play out. Okay, and to address your 951, hi, it's Jeff, thanks for, thanks for the question. Uh, so I think some perspective is, is you know, globally, Duop is about a half a billion dollar um, uh, brand, and certainly we've said that we believe that 951 could certainly double that up or more. I'll give you the perspective of why we think that way. So if you look at the advanced Parkinson's patients, about 85% sort of cycle when they stay on these generic orals that become less and less and less effective. And the only thing they can really do, and that's about 15% of the market, the advanced Parkinson market, is they can move uh, to either deep brain stimulation or Duopa, but you gotta go through a surgical barrier. So the families and the patients are forced to think, if, if, I, if I need to get improvement in my symptoms and my quality of life, I'm forced to basically think about, do I get a hole in my head or a hole in my stomach with a gastric surgery? This is gonna be a sub Q. And so we see in our market research that at least 40 to 60% of people never wanna to move towards DBS or Duopa. So we think this is a way where we can start to expand and create a new market segment, in essence, a subcutaneous segment uh, where you don't have to take that risk on the surgery, uh, and like you mentioned in the movement disorder centers, uh, there's a significant amount of uh, experts that are excited about this new option, and uh, we believe that it's going to be a real uh, innovation for patients uh, uh, without having the surgery. So, and Chris, this is Rob. As Jeff said, I mean, we expect this to be market expanding. At the J.P. Morgan conference earlier this year, we did give peak revenue guidance for 951 greater than a billion dollars. Obviously, Duopa is a half a billion now. If you're modeling it, obviously there'll be some level of cannibalization, I'd say minor level of cannibalization on, on Duodopa, but when you think about the combination between 951 and Duodopa, obviously it's gonna grow the revenue for the company and expand the market. Thanks, Chris. Operator, next question, please. Thank you, it's Tim Anderson with Warp Research. Hi, uh, if I could just go back to the whole 23 versus 24 thing, Am I, I thought that in the past you guys have said earnings would trough in 2023 and then return to growth in 2024. Is that still the case or is that off the table? And then second question goes back to the 154 compound, your antibody drug conjugate. Uh, we, we understand that the timing's still on track, but I just, it feels like to me there's a distinct lack of enthusiasm towards this program. You don't seem to mention it much or at all, really, despite its novelty and despite it being in your most critical franchise of immunology. So has the enthusiasm waned over, let's say, the last couple of years? So, Tim, this is Rob. On your first question, what we've said, we've talked about this, you know, 45% uh, with a range around that, plus or minus 10%. Uh, and using the, obviously the, the Europe analog as an example. And in that case, with the steep erosion year one in 23, you would expect then you know, the trough to be in 23 and you return to growth in 24. Uh, you know, as, as, as this plays out, we'll, we'll see how that, shake, that shakes out. Ultimately, if more of it happens in 24, you obviously have another year of growth for all your, 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 your growth brands. And so, you know, you have a, a different floor in that scenario, but most importantly, it's what happens in 25 and beyond. When you look at this company with, with the growth drivers we have, we'll be delivering high single digit growth in 25 and beyond, which is industry leading. We'll have the lowest LOE exposure in the industry in the second half of this decade. And so, you know, we're focused on the long term and we're, we feel very good about the prospects of this business. But as, as it stands now, the most recent uh, direction we've given is expect that first year uh, erosion, so that 45% plus or minus 10%, which then play out to you know return to growth in 24. We'll obviously update the market as we see it play out next year. Uh, maybe I'll take this one. Uh, this is Tom Hudson. Uh, I'm a clinical immunologist, and I, I know uh, how we've been using steroids. They can give very profound and deep uh, immunosuppression, decreased inflammation, and that's often used in severe cases uh, when a patient shows up. So we know that 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 uh, the response is very strong, but there are a lot of side effects. And when the, our problem is always weaning the steroids out in the clinic, 
so here, again, the combination of an immunomodulator like TNF and, uh, and a steroid have a, that potential of giving us that deep, deep response very quickly to remove the uh, immunosuppression. And, and based on the data we've seen preclinically in our phase one studies, we're not seeing those biomarkers or side effects in the bone or brain or cortisol or others. So we've already demonstrated that, and we had nice data. Uh, the other, so that's my enthusiasm. We expect to see deep responses, durable responses with a much well to better tolerated than steroids. Uh, our program, and we've shown this also, is that we've actually believed in the platform and we're developing steroid ADCs for other targets to target other immune systems, other, other immune cells, uh, more specifically around some T cells or some B cells or some fibroblasts. These programs are coming forward. We think this is a profound platform uh, in immunology to go after different biologies around in, in uh, very targeted uh, steroid suppression of different sp specific immune cell types, and that's going to play out over the next couple of years. So based on the data we saw, we expanded the platform to other uh, biomarkers, uh, uh, getting into other specific immune cell types. Uh, of course, if we're quiet because we need to see the data, all the studies have been uh, fully recruited. Uh, actually moved faster than we expected, and the data was randomized. We're just going to see the data in, in the fall uh, because it's the blindest study. But the enthusiasm is, is there. Uh, and we also, of course, seeing that data, and then we have PMR because we also started the, the, the studies there and Crohn's disease. We'll see that data later, but the more data we have, the more likely we're going to expand this program to other indications where we believe that uh, deep uh, steroid suppression with TNF uh, might actually bring new solutions for patients. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Operator, next question, please. Thank you. Our next question is Jeff Meesham, Bank of America. Your line's open. Great. Uh, thank you so much for the question. Um, not to belabor the, the point on, on Humira, but I wanted to ask you, is the long-term, uh, meaning the four-year kind of trends that we saw this quarter for Humira in Europe, is that still a good proxy for how you guys are thinking about the tail for, for Humira, uh, just given we're coming up on four years in Europe and we're talking about, you know, high single-digit erosion still. So I wanted to kind of ask you about the, you know, the, the, the tail piece of what you expect in the U.S. And the second question, um, just on RINVO, you know, I wanted to ask you also on the, since the FDA, you know, uh, labeling change, you know, you've just seen any, any changes with regard to, you know, persistent rates or, um, you know, or, or new starts, um, just on your, your feedback from the field and, and how docs view the safety of the JAK class. Thank you. So, Jeff, this is Rob. I'll take your first question. So, I, you know, the way we've talked about humor erosion, it's, the way it's played out in Europe is we saw that steep erosion year one, more moderate erosion years beyond. Uh, you know, in our modeling now, that's probably the best way to think about it is, you know, steep erosion year one, more moderate. You know, you'll have an annualization impact in year two, but more moderate beyond that. It's been Specifically within the Wave 1 countries, when we look at Europe uh, and the rev level of revenue we have this year relative to pre-LOE, we still have about 30 percent of, of the revenue footprint, so it gives you a sense of where Europe is after four years. Uh, obviously, you know, as we model the U.S. out, and, and we'll be more specific in the future, but, you know, right now we're using uh, Europe as an analog. And regarding uh, RINVOC in terms of um – perceptions from the field or what we're seeing, it's, it's largely developing as we, as we predicted. So, you know, we do see segments of physicians that are more uh, wary of the jacks after, after the label change. However, you know, we anticipated that. So we are starting to see uh, a, uh, a recovery in second line plus in RA as we anticipated. And the new indications, because really we'll be the only JAK inhibitor with the four big indications of uh, RA, PSA, AS, and then non-radiographic ultimately in the fall, that just builds upon the confidence level of, of the physician. So that's what we're feeling from the, from the field. I, I'll mention maybe some color on ulcerative colitis. I mentioned that we're encouraged on the ulcerative colitis start. So we saw in the quarter, because we launched in early April, um, you know, we saw 600 unique gastroenterologists start to write prescriptions, which is quite interesting and good, if positive. And about half of those customers had never written a JAK inhibitor. So Zelljans was approved. And so we're seeing, obviously, uh, the ability of these customers to understand the overall risk-benefit of Rinvoke relative to, let's say, another JAK inhibitor. So I feel that, you know, our communication is on track, 
and uh, we're seeing positive feedback as we build the indications uh, that we've highlighted in the call. Thanks, Jeff. Operator, next question, please. Thank you. Our next question is Colin Bristow with UBS. Your line's open. Hey, good morning, and thanks for taking the questions. Uh, another one on the 23 Humara guidance. Could you just walk us through, you know, at the point at the end of 3Q, what percentage of contracts or volume will you have confirmed at that point? Um, and, and then, you know, it, it sounds like that by the by the time you have the full year results, you're still anticipating that there could be a meaningful change. Could you just confirm that's a fair characterization? And then uh, just on AVV 154, um, what are you hoping to see with the phase two data that we're going to get at year end? And, and what's the threshold here that you need to surpass to move forward? Thanks. Yeah, so if we look at the, um, the discussions that uh, we've highlighted and Rick highlighted, I think, and they're progressing as we would expect. So typically they start in the late spring. Uh, and look, these are complex negotiations. They go on for many, many months. Uh, in many years, we would have completed the at least the large PBM negotiations, which is the vast majority, the volume, you know, by that October time frame. In some cases, as you probably know, the payers would publish this information, uh, but very often not always. The immunology uh, and inflammatory um, segment, those, those negotiations can go on longer uh, and they're very often uh, published as a TVD in what used to be called the exclusionary formulary. So we would, uh, as Rick mentioned, we would have visibility to sort of the status on the volume in that October time frame. That, that's a reasonable assumption. Again, I don't know for sure, given the complexity of, of a biosimilar negotiation, which has never taken place before. Um, but that's a reasonable way to think about when we'd start to have the visibility to the volume component, as Rick highlighted. Yeah, and it's Rupal on the 154 question. You know, dovetailing on what Tom just walked through, uh, things that we want to see are, are consistent with uh, how we develop in immunology. You know, certainly raising standard of care. So the way this was designed was to have that anti-TNF and then that direct delivery uh, to avoid uh, systemic side effects of the steroids. So you'd see sort of that one-two punch as uh, Tom was describing and see that depth of response. So once we see that type of information along with uh, how it looks from a steroid standpoint, metabolic effects, bone effects, taken together will give us a great sense of where it could fit. Um, you know, uh, before anti-TNFs, uh, even after we're studying patients that have failed anti-TNFs in this phase two study, so taken together, that will give us a, a really good sense of where to go. And then remember, we're also going to get data in polymyalgia rheumatica. Uh, it's not an uncommon disease, and these patients are, uh, many of them are steroid dependent, 50% or so, uh, three years and going, and they can't uh, withdraw from steroids, maybe a third, can be five plus six years, they're stuck on steroids. So we'll see that data where we're able to prevent them from flaring and to be able to reduce their uh, systemic steroid dose. So there's um, multiple facets to this and potentially uh, a number of opportunities and then later on in Crohn's disease as well. Thanks, Colin. Operator, next question, please. Thank you. Our next question is from Chris uh, Shibanani with Goldman Sachs. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, two questions, if I could. For Skyrisi, if I could just return to this question of how you're thinking about the long-term guidance. Uh, I think about Skyrisi recalling that you said $7.5 billion, consisting of about six from the Soriatis complex. Um, and yet you're almost already approaching something close to $5 billion. So can you tell us how you're thinking about how that could factor in any long-term thinking? And then for Epcaridumab, positioning of that treatment in the overall treatment paradigm. How are you thinking about that in relation to, for instance, CAR-T therapy treatment options before, after? Thank you. So, Chris, this is Rob. I'll take that question. So, look, we're very encouraged by SkyRizzi's Sky continued strong performance to remain confident in our ability to achieve or exceed that 2025 guidance. Now, keep in mind, I mean, the street also reflects that, too. The street is about $400 million higher than that $7.5 billion. 
that said, we don't intend on frequently updating that guidance. You know, obviously, we'll we'll provide that guidance uh, update you know, every few years, or if there's there's an event, or if there's a major disconnect. So obviously, if the street was way off, um, you know, we want to we want to point that out. But you know, overall, we're very encouraged about the the uptake for Sky Rizzi. It's clearly demonstrating its ability to drive long-term growth for Abbey, uh, and we'll provide an update to long-term guidance at the appropriate time. No. Thanks. And uh, to me, on, on the upgrade, I have a question. So I'm not going to go through all of the data points again. We've we've described them several times in the public public domain. What 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 I would remind you of is that you know um, we've observed extremely robust efficacy in a, a heavily pretreated population. Now it's true to say that 40% of those patients had failed CAR Ts, but 60% of those patients didn't fail CAR Ts. And therefore, um, you know our our expectation, our intention rather, uh, and as we've mentioned earlier on in Tom's prepared remarks, um, we are anticipating filing for accelerated approval uh, during the second half of this year. Uh, and I think that what you can expect is that we believe that the, the, total, the total population, uh, the total relapsed refractory population, whether or not they fail CAR Ts, should have access to epicaridumab because of the strength of the data overall. In terms of future positioning, we've also discussed in the past uh, our intention of initiating uh, multiple phase, additional phase threes. The, Confirmatory study um, for the DLBCL uh, application, what would be the confirmatory study, the phase three study is ongoing, that's in the relapsed refractory setting, and our anticipation is that we will initiate multiple additional phase threes, uh, both in DLBCL and uh, other indications over the coming 12 to 18 months. Maybe I could just build on that, Chris, it's Jeff. So we've started to, uh, you know, talk to uh, different types of physicians, whether they're, you know, in the CAR-T centers or certainly the community centers. Uh, we're increasingly believing that, um, you know, this, this lymphoma is, is treated in the community centers. And so what we hear, at least at a high level from our research so far, is, wow, that, that efficacy is incredibly impressive, even after CAR-T. But where they go is this simple sub-Q of epcaridumab may be the fastest way to deliver T cells to my patients I'm dealing with. So to build on Neil's point, um, you know, that data doesn't look like it's niching the drug. In fact, it looks like it's sort of contributing to the idea of, like, this is a democratized uh, type of, of medication for the lymphoma. So it's very encouraging uh, uh, from our initial work that we're doing with physicians. Thanks, Chris. Operator, we have time for one final question. And that question comes from David Reisinger with SBB Securities. Yes, thanks very much, and thanks for all the, the details uh, on today's call. Rick, I was hoping that you could uh, help us uh, to understand the current M&A landscape. How would you characterize it broadly? And then uh, if you could also comment more specifically on AbbVie uh, with respect to the transaction opportunity uh, set uh, for AbbVie. Thanks very much. I think if you look at the M&A environment, uh, you know, I think many players are, uh, are trying to add to their portfolios. Um, I think there's less of an appetite for larger transactions right now uh, in general across the industry. Uh, some of that's probably uh, predicated on the fact that, you know, the FTC has been pretty tough in their language around larger kinds of transactions and your ability to be able to get those through. And um, I think as it relates to us, I mean, we have continued to execute the strategy that we that we put in place after the Allergan transaction. Allergan obviously brought us a tremendous amount of diversity. That, that, that transaction has been highly successful and has really changed the, uh, the look and the shape of AbbVie and has clearly enhanced our performance and, and we've done quite well. Our focus is uh, continuing to look for opportunities to be able to fill out our portfolio in areas that we believe there are opportunities to bring in strategic assets. Uh, we're probably working more on earlier stage assets to add to our R&D pipeline. Uh, Evercreate Map is a good example of the kinds of things that we're out looking for and finding uh, to supplement uh, the overall pipeline, and I think that strategy has worked well, and it's the strategy that we'll continue to do going forward. Thank, Thank you. David. Thanks, David. 
That concludes today's conference call. If you'd like to listen to a replay of the call, please visit our website at investors.abbey.com. Thanks again for joining us. And thank you. This does conclude the call. You may disconnect your line, and thank you for your participation.